makes someone remarkable? Is the college application process fair? Do you mind being described as the white people whisperer? What is the optimal age to get married? You start to find the non-obvious way kind of works. Is there like a cartoonist community? That year was the first year that we ever heard a teacher talk about race. So many times when we go live with these things, it's like five, four, three, two, one, boom. boom. <laughs> Welcome to the Non-Obvious Book Review. I have my very good friend, Joey Coleman, and this is a big moment for you, my friend. You are launching your book right now, actually, this week. So congratulations on that to start off. Oh, Rohit, thanks so much. I so appreciate the chance to be on the show, have a conversation. And yeah, it is crazy times right now, but that's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's been a lot of years coming. Excited to have reached the either finish line or starting line, depending on your perspective. You know, I'm excited for you. And this book is the long awaited sequel. So you had a very successful book that you launched called Never Lose a Customer Again. And now you've launched Never Lose an Employee Again, which is a very timely book because a lot of people are thinking about how do I keep my best people? And this book has the answer to that. So we're going to talk about how to keep your best people. Obviously, you don't want to hold on to your worst people. So you're trying to keep your best people. How do you do that? And my first question for you to start off is, We've heard the cliche, I think it's a cliche, but maybe it's true, that people don't leave companies, they leave bosses. Is that true? You know, it's partially true, but it's more than that. I think many companies hear that cliche and they say, well, all we need to do is focus on our middle managers. And as long as we have our middle managers and you know our leaders taken care of, everything sorts itself out. It's, it's kind of like the improv statement of yes and, right? That's important. Don't get me wrong. You need to do that, okay? Don't mishear me, anyone. But you need to think about the employee experience before that, before they're actually at the job, you know, working for that manager, whoever their boss is. And you also need to think about what that means long term. How does that ebb and flow over time? Because they're going to have different bosses, different managers, different people they're working with. So it's not enough just to focus on, well, let's make that one relationship when they start great. We need to think about all the touch points and interactions across the entire employee journey. So you have a very extensive model, an eight-step model, I think it is. I do, yes. <laughs> um, for uh, for mapping this out, which is uh, something we're going to get into, and I know people love frameworks, but I'm always curious as a fellow author, when you start to look into a topic like this and you think about a framework, did you start with four steps? Was it like five steps where you're like, oh, you know, do I really want eight steps? Like, right, right. Let's eight start at eight. Model? Let's. That sounds yeah. nice and simple, you know? Yeah. Exactly. But, like, how did you land on eight? Well, it's interesting when two, one little story, and then we'll lead, I'll specifically answer that. So lots of people have been saying to me, Joey, wait, you are the customer experience guy. Now you're trying to be the employee experience guy. And it's like, friends, customer experience and employee experience are two sides of the same coin. I had been in customer experience work, whether that's consulting or writing or speaking, for about five minutes when I realized that if you don't have great employees, you can't deliver a great customer experience. So they're inextricably linked. They're really important and they serve each other. But a lot of the effort in my first book was focusing purely on that customer side. And the reason for that is if we look at most organizations, we've got marketing and sales and kind of customer support and ops on one side. And they're dealing with all the customer experiences. And then over on this other side, we have human resources, the HR department, the people department, and they're dealing with employee experience. And respectfully, it's kind of like they're two separate silos. No one wants the two to touch. And with all due respect to my friends in the HR industry, you know, whenever anybody says, we're going to invite HR to this meeting, that generally doesn't mean something good is about to happen, right? It usually someone's in trouble means if you're doing Yeah, that. someone's in trouble. Something's wrong. We got to worry about this. So when I started to think about this book, I always knew I was going to write a book uh, that looked at employee experience, but I didn't know if it was going to be enough to be a whole book. And when I started to look at it, I realized that the same eight phase framework that had worked for creating remarkable experiences across the customer journey mirrored the employee journey. 
Now, we actually changed one of the titles because it's more relevant in a customer context to say one thing and more relevant in employee experience to use the lexicon of a different word. But other than that, the phases are the same. And the did reason, that surprise you? It, it didn't. It didn't. It surprised me pleasantly because I was like, oh, this is great. I only need to remember one framework. I wrote the book. Now yeah, I wrote the first one, whichever book. speech I give. <laughs> but on the other hand, it didn't surprise me. And it didn't surprise me because we're talking about humans. And at the end of the day, no matter where you are in the world, no matter what industry you serve, humans are humans. Now, I respect that there are cultural differences, there are demographic differences, et cetera. And I don't mean to diminish those. But the idea of when a human first is interested in something, they're curious, they're exploring, they're a little cautious, then they get excited about it. Then they get to the point where they're like, yes, I want to do this. And then it happens. And then we automatically say, oh, wait, I'm not sure I want to do this. And then we have a little doubt and we have to build back up again until hopefully over time, we have a strong foundation under the choice we've made, the product we've started using, the service we've used, or the company we've started working for. So the pattern as far as like human evolution makes perfect sense. And to me, it's in some ways now not a surprise that the customer experience and the employee experience, if you were trying to improve them, if you were trying to increase retention, would have the same framework. Zoom out for us a little bit on this problem because I feel like, and I feel like I've read that retention is a huge problem right now in terms of companies not being able to hold on to people. Is that really the case? It's an enormous problem, Rohit. And I would posit it's a problem that most organizations aren't paying close enough attention to. Here's the thing. Most people, I think, are saying, well, I've seen the headlines about the great resignation and I've heard these phrases about quiet quitting. So this is a new thing. It's actually not. About 10 days ago, Gallup released its most recent research on employee engagement. They looked at 60,000 people in the United States, although there is research that matches this globally. And what they found is that 77% of workers are not engaged at work. 77%. This is the highest percentage that they've recorded in the 20 plus years of doing this annual survey. So this isn't new. This is a trend that has just reached a tipping point. And when we combine that lack of engagement with the COVID pandemic and so many companies shifting how they treated their employees and where employees work from and how that happened, we have a scenario where the employees have realized that the emperor has no clothes and the disengagement is off the charts. And almost every business in the world has recognized that having employees work remotely can be okay. Now the marketplace is global. It used to be you'd work for a boss mm. that was within 30 miles of your house or at least a company. Now it's highly likely you're working for a company that is time zones away or countries away. Right. And so I think the confluence of all of those things has made this problem that has always been kind of this small problem in the background, an enormous one. Last stat I'll share. The most recent research shows that 65%, 65% of workers globally are actively considering a new job in 2023. 65%. Wow. These numbers are staggering. And when you, I mean, I've seen a lot of the same studies too, and they always talk about engagement, like employee engagement or our employees engaged. What is that actually measuring? Like when they say an employee is disengaged, does that mean someone hates their job and they suffer every day? Or does it mean that they just show up and kind of do the bare minimum? Is there like a continuum there? What does that actually measure? There's definitely a continuum. And most of the research looks at, Kind of engagement from a point of view of do employees feel fulfilled at work? Do they feel they're making an impact at work? Do they have a sense of their own career progress and possibilities? And the reason why I think quiet quitting has become such a uh, term of art or phrase in the last year in particular is because it was a new name for something we'd known for a long time, which is employees showing up, they're there, but they're not there. They're not bought in. They're not contributing at the highest level. They, their employer feels like they're dialing it in. 
And frankly, the employee feels like they're dialing it in. They feel like, you know what? I can give 60% and that's good enough to not get fired. So I'm just going to do that. And employers are saying, we want 90%. We want 110%. And the employee's like, yeah, but I gave 80% and you didn't really notice any difference from 60%. So why don't I just give 60% and call it a day? <laughs> so I want to point out, though, because a lot of times employers are like, see, it's all about these employees. And especially this turns into generational conversations where we're like, oh, these youngsters, they just don't know how to work anymore. No, y'all made this. And when I say y'all, I mean the organizations that are hiring people. It's like you didn't connect with people. You threw them into the deep end of the pool. You said swim and figure it out. And you didn't put a lot of time or effort into their career pathing. You didn't put a lot of time and effort into their training. You know, so many companies onboarding is a one or two day event. And then yeah. on day three, it's like, you're good to go. Do you <laughs> but want is there a, longer um... than three days? <laughs> Cause we should maybe spend more than three days getting them on board. I mean, depends on how much training you need for a job maybe, but I wonder uh, the generational thing is interesting. Uh, is there an, a generational difference in expectation as to how much training or feedback or engagement a job should offer? I think there is and there isn't, right? So what the research shows is that that feeling of wanting higher levels of engagement, higher levels of purpose, higher levels of impact and connectivity to the work cuts across all generations. What has happened is if we look at the baby boomers and the Gen Xers and kind of the older generations that are still in the workforce, they'll look at it and say, yeah, I'd really be awesome to have this, but I've never gotten it at any point in my career. So I guess... <laughs> I'm just going to, I guess it's not up. a thing I should expect. I guess it's not a thing I should expect. Exactly. Whereas newer employees coming into the marketplace are saying, no, no, no. If you don't deliver this, I quit. I go somewhere mm -hmm. else. And when we yeah. look at the gig economy, for example, any person who has a car and a phone can make money driving for Lyft or Uber. Any person who has a phone can make, and maybe even a bicycle can make money delivering food for DoorDash. So the challenge of finding and getting a job is not nearly the challenge it was when, and I say this respectfully, you and I were coming up, right? You know, it's like, it's a little <laughs> different world, not to date yeah. either of us. So I think that's kind of what's at play as relates to the demographics. Now, this is obviously a huge topic. Uh, a lot of people are paying attention to it. Employee engagement, I mean, as you know, I see a lot of books every year through the Non-Obvious Book Awards we do, and, and that's a hot topic. So when you think about your book, what makes Never Lose an Employee Again non-obvious? I think what makes Never Lose an Employee Again non-obvious is the stories I tell and the case studies I provide are from companies like yours. And when I say companies like yours, I mean the folks who are watching, the folks who are listening, the folks who are thinking about, well, how would I apply these principles to my business? One of the things I do very early on in the book, it's, you know, in the first chapter is I have two charts. One chart breaks down the 50 plus case studies from all seven continents. Yes, we got Antarctica in there too. The 50 plus <laughs> case studies into categorization by revenues. The other one breaks all 50 case studies down into categorization by employee size. So when somebody's thinking about, well, Joey, I've got 20 employees and I haven't had anybody quit yet, but I've seen the headlines and I'm worried. What should I be doing? They can dive right to case studies that are from a similarly sized business, potentially in a similarly sized industry. We, we have dozens of industries reflected in the case studies as well. Or they can say, well, Joey, I don't have a lot of money to spend on employee experience. Great. You can take your revenues and maybe dial down a level or a breakdown in the chart and say, well, what's a company with less revenues figured out how to do creatively? And they've been able to make the investment that we could easily do. And so I think what makes it non-obvious is it's stark applicability to businesses of all sizes. Last thing I'll say on this is the majority of businesses on the planet have less than 100 employees, which is why the great majority of case studies in this book come from companies with less than 100 employees. 
Mm. And it is, I mean, that's one of the great things that I really loved about the book and, and about everything you do, which is that it's really based on real examples, real case studies. And you mentioned case studies across industries, across different topics. And that is really what you, the sense that you get as you kind of go through this book. And I want to dig into some of those case studies. So maybe we can start with one. And what I'm curious about is, let's say you've got a company, they're trying to create a better employee engagement. They're worried about this. It's not a terrible place to work. They haven't employed a lot of assholes. You know, the <laughs> basics are there, right? They have a decent team. People seem to be doing okay work, but they want to take it up a level. Do they kind of start and go through the exact same process that like you would take Lego through? Uh, and is it just you scale it down or you scale it up based on like if you're Lego or if you're like a company with five people, or are there certain things that you would tell them to start with first? Well, one of the questions I get asked a lot, Rohit, is do we start with the beginning? Do we stop the bleeding? Do we we start with the people we haven't hired yet, but for the open positions we have? Or do we deal with all these people who've been here for years and we hmm. maybe didn't do as good of a job as we should have done at the outset? There's no right answer. But to me, the answer is yes. Right. We want to stop the bleeding on the front end. But if you're not hiring for an existing position right now, if I'm talking to you about improving your job descriptions and your interview process and, you know, what you do on the first day on the job and you're like, Joey, we've got eight employees and everybody's been here and we're not hiring right now. We can probably shelve some of that and focus a little more on what's happening right, right. now. And so since almost everybody listening, everybody watching has at least one employee, right? Or has someone that works on it. By the way, by employee, I also mean contract workers, mm -hmm. part-time workers, anybody who's part of your team is looking for some type of employee-esque experience. So what I would say is let's focus on the people who've been here for a while. Mm -hmm. And in many instances, those are the folks who in my methodology, we would refer to as the adopters, the people who are bought in and then they're there. The question to ask yourself as it relates to your adopters is, are you celebrating them consistently in a way that feels meaningful to them? Quick story. I was talking to one of my clients the other day and they said, Joey, we uh, uh, had one of my employees come up to me the other day and say, guess what today is? And I was like, I don't know what today is. What is it? And they said, it's my seven year anniversary of starting here. Now, this leader is very self-aware. I'm a big fan of the work he does. And he came to me and he's like, Joey, I was crestfallen. I was like, oh my gosh, this person has been here seven years and they know it's their anniversary and I don't. I know I've had the pleasure of spending some time with you and your amazing wife. You've spent time with my amazing wife. You know, I focus on remembering this anniversary, right? This is, this is the one that I got to make right. sure I never forget. <laughs> But anniversaries matter to our employees as well. So one of the first things you can do is go back into your records and find out the start date of everyone on your team and then plug that into your calendar as a recurring event and celebrate their anniversaries. Mark the passage of time because I will tell you they are marking the passage of time. They're thinking I've been here five years. Where mm -hmm. is my life? They're thinking I've been here seven years. I wonder if they really care about me anymore. Right. They're already having these conversations. The question is, are you going to participate? Are you going to celebrate? Are you going to acknowledge those things in a meaningful way that lets that person know that they matter? Mm, that's a great, that's a great tip. And, and it is something that I think a lot of people don't think about uh, or don't think often enough about. As you were writing the book and you were going through all of these case studies, I'm sure Sure, you had moments where you uncovered something that a company was doing where you thought to yourself, man, that's so brilliant. Like, I wish that everybody was doing that. Can you share some of those types of stories? Oh, I, I only found about 50 of them when I was going through the process, <laughs> Rohit, right? I mean, that's the thing. So let me, let me talk about one since we were talking about those adopters. This is one that actually didn't make the book. OK, so as you well know, when you're writing a book, there's some stories that don't make the book. And maybe by telling this story, it'll hopefully give you an idea of some of the stories that did make the book, because I think this is a pretty cool one. But we regrettably couldn't fit it in. Our mutual friend, John Rulin, runs a company called Giftology. And yeah. John thinks very creatively about employee benefits. 
So what are the benefits that we're giving to our people? He has two employee benefits that I have never heard about in any other organization. And when I share these two employee benefits with leaders, they say, oh my gosh, we should start doing this tomorrow. Okay, so here are the two benefits. Benefit number one, everyone that works for his company gets free house cleaning. So everyone that works for his company they go and find a house cleaner or someone to come in and clean their house on a regular basis that they like. They pay for this person and then they submit that bill for 100% reimbursement from the employer. Now, the, I asked John about this. I was like, John, why don't you just find a company and you know set it out? And he's like, Joey, different people approach house cleaning different ways. Mm -hmm. Someone at every week, someone at once a month, someone at like once a quarter, you know, or if they've got a big party coming up or something like that, some feel a little sheepish about it. So we put the power in the hands of our employees to pick the frequency, the type of cleaning that they want and who they want to do it. And then they just get reimbursement. Now, what's important to note is the great majority of people that work for John are working moms. Now, I want to be very clear. I'm not saying it has to be this way, but in many households, the mom is not only responsible for running the household, but is often working outside of the household as well. And when we think about cleaning, is kind of defaulting back to that person. So what John has said is like looking at his employees, this is a benefit that he knew they would love because they don't have time to clean the house the way they want to. So he builds this in. The other idea that they have and other employee benefit is paid for date night. Similar story. You decide that you need to get a babysitter or you want to go out on date night. John will pay for this. You pick the one you want, you submit for reimbursement. You can submit for babysitting anytime you want, as many times as you want. Now, I asked John about this. I was like, John, are you worried that, you know, employees are going to say, well, I'm getting a babysitter every night. We're going to dinner every night. He said, yeah, Joey, people worry about the abusers, the folks who are going to do it a lot. He said, but if you've hired the right people, you've got to trust that they're going to govern themselves accordingly and be respectful of you and the company and the resources. He's like, you're trusting them to do that with the clients. Why wouldn't you trust them to do that in their own lives? I'm like, that's an excellent point. Yeah. So what John has done with his people is he's taken two of the biggest challenges in their home life, i.e. my relationship with my partner and or my kids and what my home environment looks and feels like. And he's turned them into employee benefits. I feel like it's a really creative way to think about the value you provide to your employees outside of the workplace. Yeah, John, John's great. He's actually been on the show and a lot of his ideas are, are really fascinating. And I think people need to be more intentional with the, with the gifts they give. So that's a, that's a great example. Uh, when you were going through and writing this book, a lot of times we say, this is sort of a marketing phrase, you know, it's long awaited. And I said that in the beginning of this, uh, this conversation, because I know that when you came out with your earlier book, a lot of people did ask, Hey, when are you going to do the one about employees? How much was the motivation for you to do this? People coming to you and saying, look, the, the book about customers is great, but I like, I really want one for employees. You know, Rohit, this is a fun story. About three or four months after my first book, Never Lose a Customer Again, came out, I got an email from a reader, someone I've never met, hadn't met at that point, still haven't met. And it just said, Dear Joey, if you wrote a book called Never Lose an Employee Again, I would buy it. And I thought, well, that's interesting. That's all it said. No more context, no more addition, just it was signed off by the person. I proceeded to receive a dozen of these emails over the course of the coming months and years. And every time it was just the same thing. Dear Joey, if you wrote a book called Never Lose an Employee Again, I would buy it. Now, as a marketer, I know you're saying, you know, the market is speaking. They're telling you, we want to <laughs> give you money if we do this, right? So it, we're recording this in 2023, way back in 2019. So the book comes out in 2018. At the end of 2019, I signed the contract for the next book. We then had a little thing happen in early 2020 called COVID. And I immediately went to the publisher and I said, look, I'm still working on the book, but we have to slow the publication date. We can't have this book come out right now because it's my personal belief that the landscape for work as we know it is changing in a way that it hasn't changed this dramatically 
globally ever. There's never been a single situation that has changed the way everyone on the planet works mm. at the exact same time. Some people are like, well, Joey, the Industrial Revolution. Well, that was huge for manufacturing. But for a small mom and pop coffee shop on the island of Fiji, the Industrial Revolution really didn't impact them directly for some time. COVID did. And so we slowed everything down and looked at remote work. We looked at the changing expectations of both employees and employers alike. So to your point, it's been a long time coming, but it's been actively being worked on all along that process. Is it harder to keep a employee who's only virtual? I would say yes. It is. And it requires a different type of thinking. See, lots of times an employee who is there in person is getting emotional and energetic lifts by the proximity of being close to other humans, the collaborative nature, the creativity. Uh, you know, I think uh, the late Steve Jobs referred to it as collisions. You know, they designed Apple's headquarters to create the opportunity for people to walk by and just bump into each other in the halls and strike up conversations. So when you're in a remote world, you need to think more strategically about your collision opportunities and those opportunities that allow people to feel connection. That being said, I don't think the answer is bring them all back to the office. Okay, a lot of leaders right now are saying, well, as soon as we get everybody to the office, it's going to be normal again. Folks, a couple things. Number one, they're not coming back. No matter what you do to incentivize them, no one wants to come back five days a week. Number two, let's stop and look at what really happens when everyone's in the office. Yes, there's energetic lifts, but is the productivity that much better being in the office? Actually, most of the research shows the productivity is better at home. But more importantly, what is that employee's life experience like when we eliminate their commute? Or we take their commute from five days a week to two days a week. Or once every two weeks, everybody comes to the office for the day for some collaboration and some collisions, but they don't have to sit in traffic for an hour every morning and an hour every night just to have the fiction of going and sitting in a cubicle. With all due respect, most office places weren't that great to go to pre-COVID. And most of the people that are screaming, come back, come back to the office, aren't <laughs> planning to make the office that much better. Okay. I get that it's sitting on the couch or sitting in the dining room table at home, but there are so many benefits of not having to commute, of being able to take breaks, of being able to be more productive that I think we need to see that remote work is part of our future forever. I don't see it going away anytime soon. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, and I, and you've got some great advice here, and we've talked about a lot of uh, really fascinating tips. I think one question that I think maybe we could we could sort of end with is uh, something that I'm sure you've thought about, but I was kind of thinking as you were talking about this book, which is the perspective of it, never lose an employee again, sort of indicates that the book's going to be for a business owner or a manager or somebody who's in kind of a, a position of authority. What about someone who wants to stay at their company, doesn't want to leave necessarily, but doesn't get some of these benefits and wants to take some of the ideas from the book and trickle them upwards, if that's a thing. <laughs> Did you think about that person and how they might read it? And like, how do you take these ideas if you're not the boss? Yeah, Rohit, I love this question because what's interesting with my first book, I would talk to leaders and they would say, never lose a customer again. Oh my gosh, everybody on our team needs to read that book. When we started to take this second book around to the same people, some of them would be like, Joey, this sounds amazing. I need to read this and the C-suite and our head of HR. But really, we don't want anyone else to read it because we don't want anyone to know yeah. <laughs> just how bad our employee experience is. Folks, they already know. They work there. This is not going to be a reveal or a surprise. To your point, it absolutely works well for managers. Anybody who is responsible for the experience that a team member has, whether that's an HR person, a C-suite leader, the individual direct manager, all of those people are going to find a ton of value. But I love the fact that you point to, well, what about the people that aren't in those roles? Is there anything they can get from this book? I would posit there are two key things you can get. Number one, as you read through this book, you're going to be able to find ideas that you, to your point, can trickle up, that you can feed to your bosses. Because lots of times, it's not that leaders aren't willing to do great things for their employees. 
is that there isn't a squeaky wheel encouraging them to do it. Customers are squeaky wheels. Mm. All the other department heads are squeaky wheels. Who is the squeaky wheel employee that's saying, you know what? We need better babysitting. We need better child care. Or the person who's saying, you know what? Um, we need to think more strategically about remote work. Like it doesn't make sense for us to be here five days a week. We could work from home two days a week and it would be game changer for our people. So there is an opportunity to be the person who feeds those ideas up. And as you and I, as employers both know, those type of employees while I'm sure as an employee, and I've done this, when you're feeding it up, you're like, oh, geez, am I going to suggest something and they don't like it? Do I, I want to be that person? Do I right? want to be that person? Most employers that are worth working for love those type of employees because it shows that employee is saying, I want to be here. I want mm -hmm. to be engaged here. And I think if you do that, that is going to help me be more engaged. It is going to help me be more committed. It's going to help me be more loyal. And by the way, if one person is standing up and saying that and they share the idea and you're like, you know, wow, that's actually something that I would love. Chances are there are dozens of other people in your organization that would love this enhanced experience as well. So that's number one. Number two, some of the employers aren't going to like this one, Rohit. I just want to warn you. <laughs> I think many okay, tell employees. Me. Now you have to tell me. Yeah, I think many employees are working somewhere where they shouldn't. I think many employees are more talented, are bringing more to the table than their organization is capitalizing on and is supporting and is encouraging. And if you read this book and you say, "Oh my gosh, my employer is none of these things." And you go to your employer and you're like, look what we could be. Look what we could do. Help. I want to be part of the solution. I want to be part of building this. And your employer says, yeah, no, we're, we're never going to be able to do that. Can't afford that. Get back to your position. I think you should really consider heading somewhere else, right? Because there are employers who are remarkable. There are employers who are wonderful. And going back to the case studies, the reason why I'm excited about the fact that the majority of companies in this book are companies you haven't heard of is because they exist. They are there. You might have to look a little bit at a little bit harder. It might not be the first place you interview, but there are great employers with leaders who care, who are excited, who are interested in having you be part of a team, meaning we all work together for the same goals, as opposed to just being a mindless worker drone. They're there. I hope you can find them because it's going to be a great experience for everyone. Well, this was amazing, Joey. Thank you so much for joining me. The book is fantastic. Where can people learn more about it and more about all of the ideas and the case studies in it? So the book is called Never Lose an Employee Again. It's available wherever you like to get your books. I know if you're doing part of non-obvious book reviews, you have your favorite place, whether that's the indie bookstore, Barnes & Noble, Amazon. I make no judgment as to where you get your books, but I promise it's there. I'll also put in a little plug. What was really important to me as the author is that the hardcover version, the ebook, and the audiobook all released on the same day. So whatever way you like mm. to consume books, it's available for you in whatever platform and format you like. If you want to learn more, come to joeycoleman.com. That's J-O-E-Y, like a baby kangaroo or a five-year-old, you know. Coleman, C-O-L-E-M-A-N, like the camping equipment, but no relation. joeycoleman.com. You'll find information about the book there. Two things you can sign up to experience the book, which is an interactive uh, kind of experience with me as the author while you're working your way through the book. So you sign up to experience it. You tell me how fast you think you're going to read the book. And then you get interactions from me of course, that across that time period to kind of enhance your experience. And then we also did something new in this book called The Vault. There were so many stories. There were so many examples of things that I wanted to share in the book, but a book can only be this thick. It can't be this thick. So we built out The Vault. It's free. There's no charge to access The Vault. You come, you sign up, you get into The Vault and there's videos to see, checklists to download, additional case studies to read, bunch of stuff in there that'll hopefully help you create better employee experiences. I love that. So many ways to get involved and some really creative things as well. So thank you so much for doing that, for sharing all of those materials and for being part of the show. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, Rohit. And thanks to everybody who is listening in as well and watching. Appreciate you uh, joining in the conversation to hopefully create better employee experiences.